Hello, my name is Alex. I've wanted to play an Aztec campaign for quite a while. And in fact, I've played two, a Sunrise Invasion and a Sunset Invasion. This video will cover the Sunrise Invasion, where I'm going to absolutely min-max my co-creation. My goal is to max it out until the course will take only 6 or 7 months to create. There are a few ways to do it. What I'm going to do for sure is to adopt the Mayan religion, as it gives minus 20% CCR. And after that I will see, I will either form Russia or will grab the Mandate of Heaven. Russia has an insane amount of CCR, up to 50%. And if we grab the Mandate of Heaven and form Manchu, we will get up to 35% CCR. Let's see how this game plays out. If you do enjoy this video, I will post another one, where I will do the Sunset Invasion achievement. I wanted to get one thing out of the way. In the middle of recording this video, I've learned that Paradox is going to launch another DLC, where it will focus on the Native American nations. It's just my luck, when I finally decided to play them, they're going to change. But I've really enjoyed this campaign, so I wanted to share them with you. Now, let's get cracking. I have just done the estate things, nothing special here, it's a standard setup. After making some temporary alliances, the first war I'm declaring is against Otomi. This is for two reasons. First is I want access to this animistic province in the north. And second, I want access to these two Mayan provinces on the seaside. They are the only Mayan provinces that I can reach easily. It also makes a lot of historical sense, because the Otomis were fierce enemies of the Aztecs. The Aztec warrior poets even made poems commemorating the bravery of the Otomi warriors. In this scripted event, actually, both options are not bad, but I've decided to lose some mana and upgrade the monument by one level. And my people became so proud, my stability increased. These first wars in Mexico are actually quite annoying, because many of these nations have mountain forts on their capitals, level 3 forts, and you have to siege them with primitive units and no cannons. In this first war, I only need one province. No more, because I need to keep the total war score of my country below 100%. I need to stay small. As soon as I can, I kick the enemy allies out of the war for a bit of money or war reparations. This one can go also. Now Tlaxcala always takes forever to siege because of this level 3 mountain fort with great defenses. Although this time we got lucky, only 237 days. I wish I could take Tlaxcala, destroy the fort and return it, but unfortunately it was occupied by my ally. As a nation with a Nahuatl religion, we have the subjugation casus belli on our neighbors. And in the peace deal, we have to vassalize the country before we can take any provinces. In the end, I need only one province for myself, it borders everything I want. Before anyone else can attack my enemy's neighbors, I am going for Guamar. They are literally defenseless with no allies. It's an insta-war. Alright, we have just completed the first critical objectives of this entire campaign. We got ourselves an animist province, we can now become animist. On the earlier patches, you could apparently start converting this province immediately without even coring it, and then accept demands of the animist rebels who would spawn there. But I've read that as of 1.36, you have to core the province first, otherwise you will keep getting the nationalist rebels instead. On the latest patch, the most reliable way to get converted, which I found, is to first provoke the nationalist rebels, kill them immediately of course, then send the missionary, reduce his maintenance to zero so he doesn't actually convert, and click the button to reduce autonomy in this province. This will reset the rebellion counter. And you see, our next rebels to appear here will be the animist zealots. That's exactly who we want. We give it a bit of time, and they appear in our rebel list. Even at zero rebel progress, we can click handle them and accept their demands. Animist will now be our state religion. Several things will now be different. One, we lost the Flower Wars Casus Belli against our neighbors, and we now need to fabricate claims. Two, our religious unity has gone down the drain, it's now only 5%, meaning we'll get a lot more rebellions. Three, we can now develop institutions. Apparently, after becoming an animist, we lost our primitive status. This sounds vaguely insulting to me, but I'll just roll with this. I've decided to develop my first institution right in my capital, Tenochtitlan. I have enough mana points saved to develop it in one go. And 4, gold now has real value. We suddenly became really rich from our gold mines. I can embrace the institution immediately. We now have feudalism and our technologies will be quite a bit cheaper. After feudalism spreads into my provinces, I'm going to develop renaissance the same way. And finally, of course, we can now tick off the high income mission from our currently measly mission tree. Sorry, I'll also mention the obvious change. We have of course also lost the doom mechanics. After feudalism has spread into the provinces around Tenochtitlan, I'm ready to develop the next institution. I know it's a lot of mana points invested in a very short period of time, but it's really worth it for the future. We will out-innovate all our neighbors. You probably know the trick with expanding infrastructure in the province to make developing it even cheaper. 
Look, we went from being dirt poor to making eight and a half ducats a month. Before my next religion switch, I'm going to build a war chest. I'm earning this money while running level 2 advisors too. Hope you can see the value of becoming animist. We've developed for any sounds in this province, it will now quickly spread into our capital. We have this mission, improve capital, which gives even more development. Obviously, click it only after you have finished developing your provinces. And we can now embrace renaissance in 1457, not bad for Mexico. What I'm doing next is optional, you may want to skip this step. Declaring war on Vashtek to grab just one of his provinces, so I can spawn the Mayan rebels and convert my provinces into Mayan. And what do we do in this war? We sit on Tlaxcala again forever. Here is an alternative history bit, fair warning, I'm not going to do that. If you, in your campaign, want to become Nahuatl again, then conquer the province of Cholula and accept the event turning you back to Nahuatl. You will revert to your starting religion and will be able to continue as a Nahuatl Aztec but with the two institutions accepted. You'll get the Doom mechanics back and very strong Nahuatl military reforms. But for this playthrough we're going to go Mayan. Ok, back to our timeline. We got our one Mayan province. Like before, we're going to provoke the religious rebels after provoking and killing the nationalist ones. The nationalist ones are killed and now we need to core. This is a really annoying change they've made which adds up to 3 years of waiting to each stage. As soon as the rebellion chance for the Mayan zealots crosses 50%, we can provoke them and let these rebels convert our provinces for us. I've removed my armies from their way and set my vassals on passive, so they accidentally don't destroy these rebels. These rebels will now slowly go from province to province converting them. Unfortunately, we will not be able to accept their demands. We will need to attack a Mayan nation and let them force convert us. I'm only doing this with rebels now, because in the future my missionaries will be very weak and this way is just more efficient. One caution here is that after they besiege and convert your capital, you need to urgently unsiege it, otherwise the game will auto accept their demands, losing stability and raising autonomy in your provinces, basically messing up your economy. They've now converted most of my country, they're refusing to go to the last province, and I can kill them off and get on with my game. The next steps are a bit counterintuitive. I need to get the total size of my country below 100 war score. I'm returning the province of Zikuak to its original owners and giving one of my own provinces to a vassal. Now, my total war score is 94%. We are ready for the next war. It will once again be against the Wastek, obviously because they have the Mayan religion. The trick here is to piece out all their allies before they themselves unconditionally surrender. This unconditional surrender mechanic is something I hate with passion, because then you cannot lose the war to them. You see, in this case, I've hit the pause button literally a moment too late. They have unconditionally surrendered and I cannot ask them to convert me to Mayan, so I need to reload the game. I've reloaded the game, was swift enough with my pause button and now I can ask the Huastex to convert me to Mayan. That's the force religion button right here. Look, it uses 96% of the war score, which is the size of my country. If you have more than 100, you will not be able to use this option. Step 2 of our campaign is done, we are now Mayan. And we are primitive again, with no religious reforms completed. The gold no longer gives us much value, we need to fire our advisors, we need to do the Mayan religious reforms. The good news is that we are several technologies ahead of everyone else around us. To pass the Mayan reforms, we need to have at least 20 cities, we now have 5, be at peace, have positive stability, have no rebels, and have all our provinces scored. It's now 1470, and we are in a race against time to pass our reforms before the Europeans arrive. Ideally, I don't want to reform off of the Europeans. I want to become a tribal nation, so I have access to the overpowered indigenous ideas, and if I want to, to become a horde. In this campaign, I will be a monarchy though, because I want to grab the Chinese mandate of heaven. For the purpose of this video, I will zoom through the reforms, using the powers of video editing. This is just a standard Mayan dance, when you conquer 20 cities, pass the reform, lose some cities, conquer again, lose again, etc. I hope the new DLC will make this mechanic a bit more interesting. Of course, in this timeline, we destroy the Temple of Cholula to stay Mayan. One side note, both the Aztec tag and the Mayan religion will give you a lot of events increasing your stability. As soon as your stability goes below 3, you start getting these events. This is awesome unless you go for the court encounter disaster. This one is a scripted event, where you can choose to lose stability and get cheaper admin technology for the rest of the game. I decided not to do it because I will have a lot of admin technology discounts in the future, from playing in China and from having a lot of monuments. Mayan reform number 1, of course co-creation cost minus 20%. It was the whole point. We've been cut down to 15 cities and we need to conquer again. Meanwhile, because we're all caught up on our technologies, we got our first idea group. I need to find Europe and China, so I'm taking exploration.
Second Mayan reform, the infantry fighting ability plus 10%. Love it and will need it. Third reform, minus 10% army maintenance. We'll get another minus 10% from a Mayan monument in Yucatan. The fourth reform gives us a colonist. Will help us reach China and Europe. And in 1497 we get our final fifth reform, minus 2 revolt risk. As you see, every single one is a great meaningful benefit. I intend to stay Mayan until the end of the campaign. Usually, if you want to go tribal, you would need to reach a tribal nation in the north with your colonists. In this case I was lucky that one North American tribal nation has conquered some land nearby. The condition is that they have at least one institution adopted, which they do, because the institutions have spread from me throughout the area. I may have even sold an institution to one of the tribes. Anyway, would you look at that, we are now a one province, tribal nation. We can reform into a horde if we wanted to, for infinite mana, and it is now mid-December 1498 meaning Europeans will arrive soon. That's what I would call being a real underdog, but with huge potential. We've just completed step 3, go tribal. What I'm going to do for the next few years is basic and simple, resettle my ancestral land and construct buildings which accelerate my reform progress. I have to go through my reforms as soon as possible. The second government reform comes very soon and we take the oral traditions which accelerate the reform progress by 25%. At least I kept Tenochtitlan, my highest development gold province. My army though is way over my force limit, so force limit buildings is another priority. These ceremonial fire pit buildings is what accelerates our reform progress, and so do the long houses. We also need to maximize our tribal development growth, so we can actually settle provinces around us. And the irrigation buildings help with that. This whole tribal interaction menu is irrelevant to us, because we cannot enter any federations from here. For now, I've dropped the exploration ideas and picked up the indigenous ones, which was the reason for me to go through this whole pain. Here is why I wanted the indigenous ideas. 5% development cost will come in really handy when we have the mandate, as we'll need to develop to fight the devastation. Monthly reform progress plus 25%. Morale of armies and national manpower, 10% discount on ideas, and most importantly, minus 20% on the province war score cost. It's now the third government reform time and we take settle down, so we can actually settle provinces. In 1506 we become a two province miner by settling another golden province. What I've only now realized unfortunately is that all my earlier religious conversion efforts have been absolutely wasted. As I settle these provinces they get their original Nahuatl religion and I have to convert them to Mayan all over again. Now that I can keep the conquered provinces I can wage my wars again. We are fully reformed with excellent ideas and excellent technologies. The conquest will be quick now. And whenever I can I keep settling in my tribal lands. One interesting mechanic when playing tribal is that you get two different chiefs for the peacetime and for the wartime. And normally these chiefs have excellent abilities, like I just got a peacetime chief with 663. I have to say, I feel very good about being out of these endless cycles of creation and destruction, which are the early games in Mesoamerica. Now I can simply build my nation towards my goals. I have retaken my exploration ideas and soon I'll be able to build my exploration fleet. My fourth government reform is here, and now I can settle all my tribal lands. Obviously, I don't have a lot because of my situation. Please note that this makes me a normal monarchy, and that's what I want, because in this case I'm going for the mandate of heaven. If you don't care about it and you want to become a horde, then simply don't take this particular reform. The Europeans have finally arrived to my lands in 1518. This is nice, I prefer to fight one colonial Mexico rather than many inter-allied local tribes. I wish they would grow big faster, but they're quite slow, I wonder what is happening back in Europe. I have fought a series of wars to consolidate my power in Mexico, and by the time I reached Yucatan, the Europeans were gone. This colonial nation was so weak, it got eliminated by the local tribes. Of course, Spain is colonizing on the fringes, but that's not quite the same. I am now actively exploring both towards Europe and towards China. This is giving me a massive boost in my navy tradition, making my fleets strong. I am also building a fleet both to deter the possible European advances against me and to invade Europe. By 1537, all the provinces in Mexico belong to me and my vassals. And I can take my third idea group, religious, for the Deus Wood Casus Belli. And I managed to send the colonies to Greenland. I need it both for alliances and for war. Although it is quite easy to expand now in both South and North America. I am not at all interested in that. The provinces in both Americas don't provide a lot of manpower or money. And they will not allow me to become rich by creating trade companies for example. My priority now is to move out as soon as possible either to Africa or to Asia or both. 
Another reason I absolutely hate expanding in both Americas is the sheer amount of rebellions this will produce. I tried this in a couple of test games, both as Aztecs and as the Pirate Gotland. Both of those campaigns ended up being complete failures. What I need for my survival right now is a couple of strong alliances in Europe and Africa. Without them, an endless cycle of invasions will begin from England, France, Portugal and Spain. Ah, by the way, here is a typical stability event I've been receiving in my whole campaign. Any of these options will give me a positive stability. I am starting to colonize Africa also. I want proximity to Morocco, with whom I am hoping to get online, and I want an easy way to deus wood myself into these rich trade lands. After improving my relations with Morocco, I can royal marry them. My theory is, if I secure alliances with Morocco and Kilva, I should be quite safe. Ideally, I would want to ally also the Ottomans, but that can be difficult, because they're quite far from me. Okay, the Morocco alliance is secure. Quite happy to see them so strong in this game. I know that because they are now allied to me, they will grow even stronger. Shouldn't be a problem. Later on, if I need to, I will be able to take them out quite easily. And look, if I carry favors with them, they will help me in the war against Spain. The Ottomans are reasonably strong, and in this game, Egypt has survived and formed. I don't know if Egypt will remain independent for long, or Ottomans will soon take it over. Overall, I see nothing unusual in Europe. All countries are progressing as expected. What I'm trying to do now is find some alliances and find some ways to invade Europe. The reason I'm starting my overseas expansion with Europe is because I want to complete the mission which gives me the best units in the game, the High American. An interesting opportunity here is Iceland. They are an independent one province minor on an island, with zero alliances. Potentially I can no CB them, and from there start fabricating claims on the Norwegian and Scottish islands. I've spent a few years developing my country internally, technologies, buildings, colonies and so on. I have also full stated all my land, and fought off a couple of waves of rebellions. I now feel good enough to continue my expansion overseas now. I am not usually a big fan of no CB's wars, but this is a good case for it. We are entering a new region with no way to create claims here. The war is ridiculously easy, and boom, we have our first province in Europe, out of five we need for our mission. Now we can create claims on Sweden and Norway. One potential scenario, going from here, could be to turn into Scandinavia. And Scandinavia, as you may know, is a greatly optimized conquest machine. At this point, I created a backup save and played out two different scenarios. I will now play out the scenario with invading China, and if you want, I will post a separate video where I go for the Sunset Invasion achievement. While fighting some other neighboring tribes, I fabricated some claims on Norway. They are really small and they have no allies, apart from the tiny Denmark. From what I can see, Norway has exactly four provinces, which is what I need for my mission. These provinces are all isolated from each other. I allow them to trade companies and increase autonomy, so I don't have revolts. I've brought my entire fleet here, so Denmark doesn't get any ideas to try and attack me. Ooh, Denmark is now at war with England. This is why they are not molesting me. England is already sieging their capital, which is only one level fort. Unusual for Denmark. But I guess Sweden had a very successful independence war. After a while, England seems to have left, and I still see neither the Danish military nor their navy. A new piece of intel from Austria. The Protestant League has won the League War. Okay, then I'll stop trying to ally Austria. Defeating Denmark was a walk in the park. In the peace deal I can take Ceylon for myself, which is one of the most difficult to access provinces in the game. I probably don't need it in this campaign, but since they're giving it to me, why not? Whoa, Sweden is allied to Russia, England and Bohemia. That's a strong alliance to break up. Well, if I ever need to fight them, I have Poland on my side, because I'm very close to allying them. We have defeated Norway. We now can take our provinces. Now, if I were playing seriously in Europe, instead of taking these provinces directly, I would vassalize Norway, of course. This would give me a lot of claims on what is now Sweden, and I will quickly conquer Scandinavia from there. I might do that in my sunset scenario, but right now, I just want my provinces. I feel I now have a nice base in Europe. It's easy to defend with a good fleet, which is I'm obviously going to have. And from here, I have a couple of very good expansion paths. One is down into Scotland and then England, and the other one is into Scandinavia and then Russia. All in all, I am well satisfied with my step 4. Get at least 5 provinces in Europe. This completes our foundation setup for the rest of the campaign. For me personally, the most exciting part is starting now. I've slowed down on expansion a little bit because I want to fill out my religious ideas for the Deus Wood Casus Belli. We can use this time to explore and colonize in our west to reach China. Would you look at that, would France align me? Yes, yes they would. Now I feel absolutely secure that no one will ever attack me. Here is another unexpected benefit of playing Mayan Aztecs. I keep getting free cash. The bigger my country becomes, the more cash I get. 
We now need to complete this branch of missions. It will give us the high American military units. Hiring 80,000 troops is easy. We are rich enough to even afford mercenaries. So this mission is done. The next one is also complete because we don't have any Europeans on our heartland. And we have now qualified for the absolute best mission of the Aztec tree, granting us the high American technology group. That is the best unit type in the game. Our armies now are stronger than anyone else. From what I understand, this unit type will remain in the new patch. Having 5 provinces in Europe is the precondition for this mission, which is why we made a detour into Europe for now. From here, Asia really stands no chance against us. Unless we switch into a nation which forces a pre-programmed unit tech, like the Mughals, we will keep this until the end of the game, even if we change cultures and countries. An heir with 3 to 0? Sorry man, you're not good enough to lead our fantastic nation. <laughs> we immediately got a 3 for 5, well, that's better than before. While we keep colonizing our way to China, we continue some wars here in North America. We are slowly going down our mission tree, and apparently we've just united our home region. And we've squirreled away 2000 ducats. This mission is really welcome, it gives us some inflation reduction, and now we get our third colonist. I want to send this new dude close to Kilwa, so I can ally them. Then I will see whether I will island hop to China through India or through Alaska. And done. I got a little bit of new land, and of course I got a lot of new rebels. Up until now, I am almost always at the limit of my governing capacity. A few courthouses will help. This is another reason why I don't like conquering a lot of land in the Americas early on. It takes governing capacity, produces a ton of rebels, and doesn't create a lot of value. I'm now building pretty much a naval empire, ferrying a lot of troops around Asia, Europe, and America. And for this reason, for my tier 5 reform, I'm taking amphibious specialization to unlock the Marines special unit. Ok, Deus Vult is done. I can now stop fabricating claims and spending diplomana on my peace deals. This was really holding me back. Indigenous ideas, by the way, have very nice policies. For example, indigenous and religious gives us an extra missionary, which is very rare. And indigenous with exploration gives us missionary strength and less liberty desire in our subjects. It took many, many years for my colony in Alaska to complete, and now I have the colonial range to get into Siberia. I've put a colony right on the border with later Jin, which I guess is Manchu. Now I will start consolidating my armies and fleets in the Pacific to ship them over to Siberia. Japan is now ready to ally me. I'm not sure if they will help my wars in Asia, but as a defensive alliance, this is great. I hope you guys understand the logical sequence of my actions here. Even though the main target of my expansion is Asia, I went to Europe first, to get some strong alliances, for which I had to reduce the distance between me and my targets, and also of course to get the high American military type. Now that I'm secure, I'm starting to step into Asia. Had I gone for Asia first, the European colonizers would have already destroyed me. Another thing I'm doing is always staying current with my technologies and developing for institutions. Here it's stalled at 99.96, I will leave it without comment. And with a strong network of alliances, current technologies and strong army and navy, you're quite safe. Just in case you didn't know, a good way to send your entire fleet from one ocean to another, for a distance where it would usually die from attrition, is to assign an explorer to them and send them explore something on the side of the continent that you want. This way, they will arrive to your destination safe and sound. Like so, I've moved my entire fleet from the coast of Scotland to the Pacific Mexico with zero losses. Here, I took the Burgalones and was able to get the printing press. I'm now shipping my troops to Siberia via Alaska. It takes a lot of attrition, but what can you do? Japan is ready to share its maps of Asia with me. This will make my wars here so much faster. And when ready, we go against Manchu. We have a similar amount of troops, they have more cavalry than me. But I'm ahead of them in military technology and my units are simply better. Fighting these Yurchin nations is a little bit tricky, because they have the movement speed advantage over me. Their travel time takes a lot, and they obviously have strong cavalry. I am trying to keep my troops together, and I will aim to fight them mostly in the mountains, where they have a malus. Let's see how my troops actually perform in a battle, and they perform super well, as expected. I was not really sure what to take for my next idea group, but because I'm having to have my armies on so many fronts, across the three continents, or four, I decided to go for quantity. One issue I'm having is simply catching the Manjurian troops, they are running circles around me on the map. But here I managed to intercept one of the stacks. Beautiful, easy stack wipe. I am overstacking somewhat because usually they are running their entire army in a 50,000 stack. Tired of this whack-a-mole, I've invited Japan to help me out. 
And now I see it's a mistake. Because Japan is starting to siege the border provinces. I'm sorry, but I don't want to give these lands to Japan. In this peace deal, I took the entire Manchurian coastline, isolated Korea and importantly grabbed Beijing. That is a critical city for me to grab the mandate of heaven and become Manchu. I was also able to become an empire, as you saw. I found an interesting opportunity here. From the lands I took, I can release Ming. And Ming has cores on the entire China. That is just sheer luck, I'm going to release them as a vassal. And this gave us imperial conquest, less separatism for 25 years, meaning less revolts. I cannot call these provinces deep inland, so I gave them to my vassal Ming. I will expand it to Korea, but later, after becoming the emperor of China. Right now, I wouldn't mind an alliance with them. They are surprisingly strong for their size. I would not mind having a foothold in Northern Australia, so later I can Deus foot and conquer the future colonial nation here. Alliance with Korea is now secure, although I don't think it will last long. The mission tree will soon make them want the lands which I have. As soon as my provinces finish coring, I attack the later Jin again, via their tributary Korchin. Russia is really aggressive in this game and they are already fighting Jin. Before they conquer them completely, I want to conquer all the lands with the Manchu culture. I need a lot of them for my future mission tree. The Manchurians have hidden their troops on my border, running away from Russia. So this is easy was call for me. I have noticed that Russia has already occupied the Manchurian capital. I will now need to sit and wait until they peace out. And soon enough they do, taking most of Manchuria. Goodness me, I hope they didn't take provinces I need to become Manchu. I bet they did. In these latest patches, if Russia forms, it becomes a monster. Its mission tree offers so many buffs, military, economic and administrative, that if they're able to start going down that mission tree, they become unstoppable. Looks like this is exactly what is happening in this game. Okay, well, this means that forming Russia is impractical right now. I will continue with my other option, which is forming the Manju and grabbing the Mandate of Heaven. I had not been able to co-belligerate later Jin, and their provinces are expensive to take. This peace deal doesn't look very big, but I'm making my lands more connected, and I'm taking some territories around Nanjing, which is critical for the Mandate of Heaven game. I should now be able to grab the Mandate after a couple of wars. We move our troops into position and we attack Yue, which owns one of the critical cities I need for this. They have some allies, but we're destroying their armies very easily. In these wars, before I get the Mandate, I don't want to take a lot of land. In the future, I will be able to take them for free without coring. For now, I'm taking just a few critical provinces. We now can attack Shun with Take the Mandate of Heaven CB. We can do this because of our pagan religion and because we bought them now. This was a very easy war. The armies are avoiding contact, running away from us. All we had to do was occupy some forts and now we have the mandate. As part of the deal, we took Nanjing, which is a critical imperial city. We now own all three imperial cities and the mandate will not fall because of this. We will now need to watch out for devastation in our core provinces make sure our stability is always high, and hire the top level advisors. In other words, we will need to play a good game. As long as we do that, the mandate will keep steadily growing. Theoretically, I can also go and get some tributaries, but personally I don't want to do that. I prefer direct conquest. Having devastation in your core provinces will really destroy your mandate, which is why I prefer most of my stated land far away from the conflict back in Mexico. After we conquer enough land in China to move our borders far away, I will core these provinces also. I can no longer destroy my forts, because forts help with devastation, and whenever needed, I can develop my provinces to lower the devastation. Ooh, I get the Mosque of Beijing event. I will now get the modifier to improve my relations plus 15%. The one thing which is not clear from the description is who will add me as their historical friend. I hope it will be the Ottomans. At any rate, we have just completed our next step, taking the Mandate of Heaven. Even more good events, oh my. Maybe I should play a proper campaign in this area one time. Our ruler now is the Patron of the Arts, which is this skill, minus 5% discount both for technology cost and ideas. Very nice, especially when your ruler is as young as mine, only 27 years old. I provoked and killed a whole lot of rebels, stabilized my economy, caught up on my ideas a little bit, and while I'm waiting out the truces with Chinese neighbors, I've decided to conquer the Spice Islands. It will be nice to establish my trade capital in these lands for a lot of money. These little nations stand little chance against me. The biggest challenge in these wars is jumping around the islands. I now have the Unified China CB against all of the Chinese kingdoms. 
This is probably the best pre-imperialism CB in the game. You can take the Chinese provinces for 25% aggressive expansion, half cost, and 150% prestige. The best thing about the CB is as long as you occupy a Chinese province, it becomes your core, and you will not need to spend the admin mana to core it up. Oh, I got some tributaries by fully annexing some nations. They are tiny, they're not giving a lot of benefits, but I may keep them around because they will not join any coalitions against me. This war had lasted a couple of years longer than I anticipated, because Shu had occupied a lot of US lands, and I had to wait for them to get out of the war, but look how much land I can take. Most of this land is court, some of it is not, I guess because it's outside of the China super region. We are now the second greatest world power behind the Ottomans, we have 17.5 development. From later Jin, I won the Manjo provinces, not so much the Chinese ones, so I'm using the Deus Vult. I was able to take most of what I wanted, although it does look like I will need to fight Russia. They have already taken one or two provinces I will need in case I want to form Qing. Unfortunately, Jin has decided not to protect their tributary Korchin, but at least I can take the Korchin's provinces for myself and deny them to Russia. No, Russia also attacked them and occupied them faster than me. While my troops were down south fighting the rebels, I am starting to feel like I'm competing with Russia for a world conquest. Okay, I'll take what little remains of it. And before Russia can conquer Shun, let's get some land. Shun had fragmented into several countries during my war with them, but at least I have some land to take. The Age of Absolutism has arrived. In an attempt to max it out fast, I provoked a rebellion by eunuchs and accepted their demands. My idea was to raise autonomy in my provinces so I can lower it and get the Absolutism up. What I didn't realize is that accepting their demands also killed my ruler. I guess I should actually read the tooltips. This also gave us a couple of scripted events, one giving us a bunch of meritocracy and mandate, and the other one asking us to choose the location of our capital. Obviously, our capital has to remain in Mexico, otherwise our heartland will become a colonial nation. Aside from the untimely demise of my very good ruler though, my plot worked. We can now lower the autonomy in a whole lot of provinces, because I have a lot of them cored, to immediately boost our absolutism and as such, our administrative efficiency. Ah, uh, not as much as I wanted, only 8. Sometimes with a streak I was able to boost it all the way to 50 or so. The good thing though, is that we started the age with 3 objectives complete. We can actually kick off our golden era when we need. And we can easily complete our 4th objective by building 5 universities. This means we'll quickly get the absolutism boosts of this age. As I had expected, Korea had broken their alliance with me a while ago, and I feel absolutely free attacking them right now. Actually, I will attack their ally with the unified China CB and then take as much as I can from both. Meanwhile, I've built the 5 universities and now our splendor will grow much faster. I wish I could accept another culture, but I can't, I don't have enough technology for that. Otherwise, I would have had 5 objectives completed. My meritocracy is now maxed out at 100%, so I can select one of the mandate decrees. If you select expanding the palace bureaucracy, you will have the 10% co-creation cost reduction and 10% development cost reduction. Really powerful. Right now, because I'm fighting a very strong Korea, I've decided to go for the infantry fighting ability. Occupying Korea means a lot of fighting, barraging and sitting on really powerful forts. A little exhausting if you ask me. While fighting them, we declare on Shu. Korea is so highly developed that we cannot take a lot of provinces in the peace deal, so we are bound to repeat this Korean experience again and again. At least we can take their capital, an annoying fort in the mountains, and break their alliance with Japan. I want to attack them directly soon enough. In 1614, our development is 2.2 thousand. If you had seen my previous videos, you would know that the theory that I have proven several times is if you have between 1.7 and 2000 development in 1600, you are well on track for a world conquest. In our case, we are on track. Korea has re-entered the war on the side of their ally. I guess that's good, we can take some more land from them. I've decided not to white peace Korea for a short peace deal, but take some of their islands and forts, simply because I'm honestly tired of sieging them. Let it be a longer truce, it's okay, I have enough conquest targets around me right now. Not sure if this is an Aztec thing or it's the right setup, but I'm getting a lot of positive meritocracy events. While all of this fighting is going on, I keep colonizing the Spice Islands. The funny thing is that I'm not competing with Spain or France, I'm competing with Russia. I've been also slowly upgrading the Forbidden City Monument in Beijing. It gives me both the absolutism growth and mandate growth, a perfect combination. There is a little bit of later Jin left in the Manju lands, let's attack it. For the first age ability, I'm taking the harsh treatment cost discount, so I can keep growing my absolutism. I can now peace out Jin, unfortunately Russia has occupied one of its provinces, 
and is going to take it. And fully annexed shoe. I sat on these occupations for a couple of years because I was waiting for my Korean course to complete. I can ally the very strong papal state, imagine that. As ahistorical as can be, but why not? I'm building a powerful coalition because I need to attack Russia, who is allied to a strong Bohemia and a very strong Great Britain. Right now, Poland and surprisingly Kilwa will join me in this war. But I need more active allies. Ideally, I will get the Ottomans on my side. I came close to allying them a few times, but not quite there yet. See, I need a few provinces here to form Tsing. It's an optional target, I will most likely not do it. But I want to have the option. Until I can do that, I would at least conquer some nations on the Russian border. For my next idea set, Diplomatic. I'm quite happy with my CCR for now, because I'm not doing any large-scale conquest yet. Diplomatic will help me max out the war score of provinces taken in the war. I already have 20% discount from indigenous, and Diplomatic will give me another 20%. I got this event which gives me 5 mandate, and I've been running on 100% mandate for a few years already. I'm not fighting anyone serious right now, so maybe it's time to take one of the reforms of the mandate. The famous 10% coring cost reduction, for example. We lost 1 stability and 70 mandate. This means our army is weaker, we have much worse economy, more revolts, basically a lot of gloom and doom. I happen to have very little money at this moment. So I took the burger loans. The only thing, as Emperor of China, you need to immediately pay out a couple. Otherwise, having 5 loans will also drop the mandate. Let's end this little war for a bit of land. My intent was just to cut Russia off from Tibet. Well, we happen to have become the number one world power. I guess a humble congratulation is due to us. A few countries are really blobbing, although I'm worried about only two, Russia and the Ottomans. The Ottomans may still fall to their disasters in the 17th century, but Russia seems to be going from strength to strength. Fighting at low mandate isn't always the best idea, but I think I can overpower these few countries in Southeast Asia. Now that I have moved the front line far away from the Chinese seaside, I'm starting to gradually full state the lands here. Now I have a lot of free governing capacity, and these lands will give me a lot of money, manpower and everything else. I am using these wars to open up more expansion routes. More borders means more expansion. Although, as you can see, I'm trying to eliminate the same culture, same religion groups first, just to minimize the possible collisions. A few countries, like Ayutthaya, have blobbed a lot here. I guess I will be rotating my wars among a few opponents. As soon as I can, I keep harsh treating my rebels to increase the absolutism. And in the middle of this war, I cross the mark of 50 absolutism. Because my stability is below 3, this kicks off the court and country disaster. I'm keeping my revolt risk above 1 with war exhaustion. My idea here is that if the revolt risk ever drops below 1, stopping the disaster progress, I will immediately annex a lot of land, boosting my revolt risk. It's kinda ridiculous that you have to intentionally mismanage your country to kick off this court and country thing. But it is what it is. The benefit of plus 20 absolutism is worth it in my mind. When the earlier cores are done, I'm taking all this land, kinda encircling my enemies. I am now overextended, which is what I need to keep my revolt risk high. And done, I've mismanaged my country for long enough to trigger the disaster. I did it during the low mandate, because low mandate means more revolt risk. Downside is, both the low mandate and court and country lower your income. I will struggle economically for the next few years, most likely. Another issue is I've cored so many lands, I'm above my governing capacity again. I have four ways to resolve it. The administrative tech, certain buildings, upgrading the monument in Bangkok, and also conquering and upgrading the White House monument back in North America. Actually, the fifth way would be to complete the administrative ideas, which I have been postponing. This is when I usually like to start my golden era. It gives me 5 extra absolutism, making the court and country disaster easier to complete, and it offsets some of the debuffs of being in the disaster, like the goods produced. And we are now above 50 mandate, which means we are positive. All the debuffs of the low mandate are gone. I am making money again, and when I reduce my troop maintenance, I am making a lot of money. While sitting in this court and country disaster, I decided there would be no better time to become Manchu. You would most likely know that for that we need to unstate most of our land until Manchu becomes more than 50% of our culture, shift our primary culture and accept the Manchu identity. In the background, for quite a few decades, I have been converting provinces to Manchu culture. So this shift is not very taxing for me. We can now full state our lands again, for which I have accumulated quite a bit of admin mana, because Manchu is now our primary culture. We can start hiring these overpowered Manchu banners. These are land units which cost no money to recruit, 
they do cost a little bit of corruption, you pay only half of the maintenance cost, they have plus 5% discipline, and they use only 25% of the regiment manpower. The downside is that they take 50% longer to reinforce, but you have monuments and government reforms to offset that. The more Manchu cultured provinces you have, the more banners you can recruit, so culture conversion becomes a valid strategy from now on. I have immediately recruited a lot of banners, and now my army is big enough for the Ottomans to want to ally me. If you are all playing Aztecs, it's perfectly okay to remain Aztec. In my case, I'm going for the CCR. So I've decided to embrace my new Manchu identity and accept their ideas and traditions, which include 15% CCR. Now I have 20% core in cost reduction from being Mayan, 15% from the Manchu national ideas, up to 20% from the mandate, and I will have another 25% from the admin ideas. Altogether, it's 80% CCR, which is the maximum in this game. At 80%, you hit the cap of the current cost reduction. I have also just verified that my military units remained high American. And so we have completed the final step on this journey, becoming Manchu. From here, if you want, you can become Ting. Ting has a powerful and massive mission tree, and it does have 25% CCR in its national ideas. The problem is that becoming Ting will impose the Confucian religion, so you will lose the 20% Mayan CCR. So it's a trade between the powerful mission tree and 10% CCR difference. Because this campaign is about the maximum current cost reduction, I decided to stay Manchu, but take the Ting lands from Russia. I tried threatening Russia with war to give me back my province, but they would have none of that. Ah, by the way, there is another argument in favor of becoming Ting. They have 5% admin efficiency in their national ideas. That would most likely offset the 10% CCR loss, although it will not reduce the coring time. As you become Manchu, your capital will automatically move to the Far East. You need to be prepared for that. I immediately moved my capital to West Africa, where I have a single stated province, and then back to Mexico City. This way, I remain the new world nation, and colonial nations will not form. Meanwhile, as Manchu, we have a small but focused and nice mission tree. It was obviously designed as something transitional, and it has a few helpful boosts. These missions give us claims, improve our banner units, including some corruption refund, help us with meritocracy growth, and give us a young and powerful leader who has a legendary conqueror trait. In my case, this young man is 20 years old, and all his skills are maxed out at 6. For the next 30 to 40 years, we will have no problem generating mana. And this mission gives us 20% siege ability until his death, and better attacker bonus. I mean, what's not to like about it? And here, we get 45,000 manpower, stability, and lose some war exhaustion. I feel like I'm being spoiled by the game right now. Ah yes, almost forgot this mission, which improves my banner troops and refund corruption. From here, I play just to have some fun. I invaded Korea once again, which is now part of my mission tree. This looks like a reasonable peace deal to me. Completed this little Korean branch of my missions. The one which I found interesting here is this one, which gives me an aspect of Korean culture to adopt. It's only for a while, and I chose this one, which gives me 10% goods produced modifier. I cleaned up a few tribes in North America in preparation for my next big war. To weaken the colonizers in Europe, I attack the colonial nations first. It's now 1650s, we are entering the blobbing Armageddon stage of the game, and I no longer have to go for the best land to build my development. I can conquer the Americas. The dilemma with these colonial nations is that you can rake up a lot of war score against them fast, but to full annex them you have to thoroughly defeat them, which takes time. Usually, I leave them one or two provinces and take what I can. It's easy to come back and grab what remains later. You also have to watch your overextension. The war score here is so cheap that it's possible to get into 3 or 400 percent overextension easily. You will get overextension on the provinces which used to be tribal from the very beginning. Just for the proof of concept, so to speak, I mobilized my coalition and attacked Russia and Great Britain. I had to fully pay out the deaths of several of my allies to do that. Geography-wise, this was a real world war with fighting going on on every continent. I did not invade Great Britain and got them out of the war by fighting their colonies. From Russia, I took almost 100% war score here in Siberia. Now, if I want to, I can form Ting. We got a bit of power projection, prestige and mandate for our trouble. In a quick series of wars, we took out the Spice Islands, most of Thailand and attacked into Bengal. I dropped the now useless exploration ideas, I still have two colonists from my Mayan religion and Aztec missions, and instead took the administrative and then offensive ideas. Coring provinces now is incredibly cheap, and even without the specialized mandate decree, it takes 7 months. 
I'm converting my provinces to the Manchu culture, so I have a lot of banner troops. And it feels like my country is operating like a well-oiled conquest machine. After cleaning up a lot of smaller nations in Asia, and after my truth expired here, I attacked the 13 colonies and took out pretty much the entire thing. We are now firmly perched as the number one world power, and we are well on track for a world conquest, should we want to complete one. After this war, I'm a bit overextended at 260%, and I even ran out of the admin power. But my cores are completing really fast, 6 to 7 months, so I don't really care. I am not releasing any vassals here in the new world, because in my experience, they tend to behave unpredictably. They can release land, fragment into more nations, whatever. So I prefer to call all this land myself directly. I'm taking a few loans to upgrade the White House monument, because it dramatically reduces the state governing cost. You can now have more states within the same governing capacity. While my previous cores were completing, I attacked Newfoundland. Usually, the 13 colonies is the strongest colonial power in both Americas. After you take it out, no one else really presents a challenge. In my world conquests, I usually target 8000 development by 1700, and we are now ahead of schedule. We have 8.1 thousand development in 1697. With a heavy heart from betraying my former allies, I fought a half global alliance of Japan, Vajanagar and Adol. This war gave me a lot of development. We obviously have the imperialism CB right now. I have a large army, strong allies and I don't care about coalitions. I am liberally signing separate peace deals with every war participant one by one. Japan had built quite a colonial empire, colonizing half of Pacific. I prioritize taking their remote islands, so I cannot take their entire homeland. 200% overextension again, we will deal with it, because 7 months scoring time is quite strong. I guess I have made my point, haven't I? We are now a well-optimized conquest machine. Our co-creation cost reduction is at 80%, we have taken over most of the New World, most of Asia, we have a strong presence in India and some presence in Africa, and from here, the final push to conquer the world would be to go into Europe and Middle East. We are not at the maximum admin efficiency, although we did get 5% total from the mandate and from our government reforms. We can still max it out by forming, for example, Sardinia, Piedmont, England, Spain, and so on. Although in this campaign I don't think we really need to have a max admin efficiency. I will end the video here, because it's obvious that the wall conquest is possible. And like I said, if you want to see the sunset achievement run, please let me know in the comment and give this video a like.